The operator of a nuclear power plant in southwestern Japan has brought one of its reactors back online. It's the first time in nearly two years that any reactor in the country is up and running. But the restart has done little to dampen the debates over the role of nuclear power. NHK World's Mitsuko Nishikawa has more. Japanese officials put new regulations in place following the crisis at Fukushima Daiichi in 2011. The number one reactor at the Sendai plant in Kagoshima is the first to come online under the requirements. But many people are opposed to the restart. Some of them held a rally to voice their concerns. I'm worried this will rush other restarts to stop the concerns over the nuclear accidents four years ago at Fukushima. Others are showing support. They believe restarting the plant is the only way to revitalize the local economy. We've seen many shops around here go out of business. I hope they'll open up again. The disaster in Fukushima forced Japan to rely on other sources of energy. By May 2012, all of Japan's 54 reactors were offline. Some plant operators decided to scrap all the facilities, including the ones at Fukushima Daiichi. That leaves a total of 43 reactors in Japan, and Sendai is the only one in operation. At Fukushima Daiichi, Water passed over the reactor core and was turned into steam to power a turbine. That posed the risk of contaminated water being discharged outside the plant. But the reactors at Sendai use a different system. Contaminated water does not flow directly to the turbine. It stays within a container. Experts say this poses less risk to the environment. Under the new regulations, plant operators are required to take measures to deal with severe accidents. They must draw up emergency scenarios for bigger earthquakes and tsunami than before. Government regulators check the plans, and two reactors in the Sendai plant pass the screenings. Some people say the requirements aren't enough to guarantee the safety of local residents. Municipalities within 30 kilometers of the plant were required to draft evacuation plans, but they haven't had the time to adapt them. Some roads are too narrow, with no room for people to evacuate on foot. Kagoshima Prefecture has begun widening roads, but officials say the work could take as long as 80 years to complete. Despite these concerns, Japanese officials have stressed their determination to bring more nuclear plants back online. We have gotten cabinet approval to promote the restart of nuclear reactors. If we can confirm that the nuclear facilities have passed inspections under the world's strictest level of regulations. Japanese leaders say they'll continue making an effort to win the people's understanding. Officials at the power company are expecting the restart to contribute to the energy supply starting next month. The number one reactor is capable of providing about 5% of peak power consumption in summer. Prior to the nuclear disaster, the company depended on nuclear energy for about 40 percent of the power it generates. Officials say they are currently meeting demand by running thermal plants at full capacity and procuring power from other sources. But they say operations have been halted frequently due to a variety of problems with the aging the fisherman's facility. organization in Fukushima says it's ready to allow decontaminated underground water from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant to be discharged into the ocean if certain conditions are met. The discharges are meant to slow down the accumulation of water at the crippled facility. The Fukushima Prefectural Federation of Fisheries Cooperative Associations reached this decision on Tuesday after a cooperative in the city of Iwaki gave its conditional agreement. The group handed a list of requests to officials from the central government and Tokyo Electric Power Company. 
They include observing strict operational standards and monitoring by a third party. They also ask that compensation be paid for rumors that could impact fishing in the area. Tokyo Electric Power Company plans to decontaminate groundwater pumped from wells near the reactor buildings and then release it into the ocean. The plan was suspended in February after TEPCO was found to have failed to disclose leaks of contaminated rainwater into the ocean. The chairman of the Fisheries Federation said allowing water discharges was a very difficult decision, but he said measures to deal with contaminated water are necessary. Now we'll be waiting for a response to our requests. A senior TEPCO official thanked the Fisheries Federation for its understanding. He said the company is hoping to respond quickly. Meteorologist Sai Komori. People of Hokkaido are having to deal with record heavy rainfall. Sayaka, give us the latest. Hi there. Hokkaido typically doesn't have the rainy season during this time of year, but it has been wet since last month in the island. Now, heavy rain is pounding the south and east. In fact, Nakashibetsu, this area had about 200 millimeters of rainfall in just 24 hours. So flooding is happening. Now, we have some video coming out of the southern portions of the island. Humid air and upper cold air are causing days of heavy rainfall. Many parts of Hokkaido are flooded because of a record-breaking heavy rain. 5,000 homes were without power on Tuesday afternoon. Authorities are advising people to watch out for tornadoes as well as thunderstorms into Wednesday. Now, more heavy rain is anticipated, so flooding, landslides, all of them are going to be a continued risk. Meanwhile, down towards the south, there is a storm. This is a tropical storm named Molave. Good news is that Molave is going to move away from mainland Japan, but some high waves are expected across the east Tomari coast. Tomari Nuclear Japan. Power Plant. The Tomari Nuclear Power Plant is the only nuclear power plant in Hokkaido, Japan. It is located in the town of Tomari in the Fur District and is managed by the Hokkaido Electric Power Company. All of the reactors are Mitsubishi designs. The plant site totals 1,350,000 square meters, 334 acres, with an additional 70,000 square meters of reclaimed People land. in Nagasaki on Sunday will mark the 70th anniversary of the day an atomic bomb destroyed their city. The second bomb to hit Japan dropped on August 9th at 11.02 in the morning. Tens of thousands of people died and many more survived with injuries and radiation sickness. But the memories of tragedy are fading with the passage of time. And now one young woman is trying to keep them alive. She's visited remnants of the atomic bombing in Nagasaki to sharpen her skills as a storyteller. NHK World's Miko Suzuki has more. Yuna Aihara is a university student in Tokyo. She spent five years listening to stories from atomic bomb survivors in Nagasaki. She says it's her mission to become a storyteller who can pass on these first-hand experiences to younger people. Aihara had a dramatic encounter on her first visit to Nagasaki for a high school excursion. She met Sakue Shimohira, who lived through the bombing and who went on to recount her experience to countless students across Japan. She was in a shelter some 800 meters from the epicenter when the bomb detonated over the city. Last year, Ahara had another opportunity to meet Shimohira, who encouraged her to pursue her ambition. Ahara felt certain she was on the right road. Shimohira said, we're the last generation that can listen directly to those who experienced the atomic bomb. And she asked us to carry the torch of peace to the next generation. I felt strongly that I needed to do something, maybe to become a storyteller in the future. Since then, Aihana has visited Nagasaki every summer to hear stories from survivors. But this year was different. She went on a tour of buildings 
that have been preserved as monuments to the atomic bombing. Her first destination was the Urakami Cathedral. <laughs> <laughs> there, she met Yuki Kawasaki, a local student who volunteers as a tour guide of the building relics. Together, they traced the scars of the bombing 70 years ago. You can see the stone sculpture without its head, arms, or fingers. They were all obliterated instantly by the bomb. Kawasaki told Aihara about the tragedy that occurred at this very spot, where a bell tower collapsed into a river. She explained that many people died when the 50-ton structure fell on top of them. Talking to Aihara really inspires me. It's essential that we pass this on. It's really important to actually come to the site to learn. Next, Aihara visited an elementary school just 500 meters from ground zero. Here, about 1,500 students and teachers lost their lives. The blast spread large cracks through the walls and incinerated the interior. Volunteers have helped to preserve the remains of the building. Aihara's guide that day was Tsuyoshi Ikeda. He was a seven-year-old student at the school when the bombing occurred. He is one of only 47 people there that survived the explosion. The reason why the walls are in this state is because flames of up to 5,000 degrees Celsius blasted through the window and left them charred like this. Aihara reflected on the marks of the tragedy and contemplated what went on in the seconds after the explosion. It's clear atomic bomb survivors won't be able to tell their stories much longer. I want the next generation to know what really happened and to understand the history and its significance. Young people can really do that. I feel our generation has a responsibility to pass this on. It was really worthwhile to see these buildings. I want to learn more, especially about the history behind this. I want to become a better storyteller. Aihara says each visit to Nagasaki gives her greater confidence. Being exposed to powerful historical symbols has renewed her determination to pursue her goal. Tension has been mounting along the border between the two Koreas since landmines seriously wounded two South Korean soldiers. The South has accused the North of planting the mines. Three landmines exploded last week in the demilitarized zone in Paju, Gyeonggi province. They wounded the soldiers patrolling on the South Korean side about 400 meters from the zone's military demarcation line. South Korea's military said it had determined from debris that the North had planted the mines. Later in the day, the military started broadcasts criticizing the North using loudspeakers in two places near the demarcation line. The propaganda broadcasts are the first by the South in 11 years. The military has also upgraded its alert level in the area to the maximum, and it has increased the number of its unmanned reconnaissance aircraft and anti-tank missiles to prepare for a possible hostile reaction from Pyongyang. A spokesperson for the South Korean presidential office condemned the North. The official said trespassing on the military demarcation line and planting the mines beyond the border constitutes a provocation from the North Korean military. The official said South Korea demands that Pyongyang apologizes for violating the two countries' armistice and non-aggression agreement and punish those responsible. The U.S. military is sending half a dozen F-16 fighter jets to an air base in southern Turkey. It's an effort to strengthen its military operations against Islamic State militants in Syria. Six F-16 jets and 300 support personnel took off on Sunday from a U.S. base in Italy to Turkey's Injurlik Air Base. A year-long airstrike campaign by a U.S.-led coalition has failed to weaken the militants in Syria. 
U.S. officials agreed last month with their Turkish counterparts to use the Turkish airbase, which is geographically close to targets in northern Syria. The Turkish military has also carried out its own airstrikes against the militants. But researchers say the coalition's airstrikes have killed nearly 500 civilians. U.S. defense officials say they'll begin selecting targets based on stricter criteria to prevent the deaths of civilians.